What was the Holocaust? By Gail Herman, with a letter from the editor. To our readers, this book is about an event in history that is so terrible, it seems almost impossible to believe it actually happened. But it did. The Holocaust refers to the murder of 12 million people in Europe. Six million of them were Jewish. It didn't happen all that long ago, from 1939 to the middle of 1945. After you finish reading this book, you will know who planned the Holocaust, where and when it took place, and how it was carried out. But one thing you won't learn is why it happened. That's because there is really no way to explain something that is so purely evil. For a long time, we thought about whether or not to publish a book about the Holocaust. We wondered if the subject was too awful for young readers. But we decided it was such an important event that not including the Holocaust in the series would be wrong. The few survivors of the Holocaust are very old now. When they are no longer alive, it will be up to books to tell the painful story of what happened. Very likely, you will have lots of questions after you finish reading this. We hope you turn to your family or your teachers to talk about them. Jane O'Connor, Editor Page 1. What was the Holocaust? May 1945. Volary, a small town in what is now the Czech Republic. Gerda Weissman stood outside an old bicycle factory. She weighed 65 pounds. Her hair was white, although she was not even 21. Inside the empty building, dozens of women lay on straw. Most were sick. Many were dying. Like Gerda, they were all Jewish. For many years, they had suffered under the rule of Nazi Germany. For Goethe, the horror had begun six years earlier. It was late summer. She was 15 years old, and she had just come home from vacation. On September 1st, 1939, the weather was glorious. The sky a bright blue. Suddenly, German airplanes blocked the sun. They roared over Goethe's home in Bielsko, Poland. Tanks rolled down the streets. The German army was invading Poland. It was the start of World War II, which lasted in Europe until May of 1945. Many local people waved Nazi flags. They cheered for their new leader, Adolf Hitler. They were glad Hitler had taken over Poland. Hitler hoped to take over all of Europe. The Jews of Bielsko were not happy at all. They knew of the Nazis' hatred for Jews. Gerda and her family were told to leave their home so local German Poles could move in. Gerda's garden was fenced off with a sign that read, No dogs or Jews allowed. They lived in a basement with no water or electricity. After a while, all Jews in Bielsko were rounded up. Trucks took them to different prison camps. Gerda was separated from her mother. She never saw her again. She never saw anybody else in her family again, either. Through the rest of the war, Gerda was moved from one concentration camp to another. She labored in Nazi-run factories. She hauled coal onto trains. By 1945, she was half dead. And yet Gerda was one of the more fortunate ones. She survived. Six million Jews did not. They were killed by the Nazis in concentration camps. 
about six million other victims were also led to their deaths. Gay people, the Roma, disabled people, and people from certain religious and political groups. That day, in 1945, at the factory, Gerda saw a car approach. Two men, United States soldiers, jumped out. One came over. He was big and strong. To Gerda, he looked like a god. Does anybody here speak German or English? he asked in German. I speak German, Gerda answered. Then she added, We are all Jewish, you know. So am I, the man said. His name was Kurt Klein. May I see the other ladies, he added. Then the man held the door for Gerda to go inside the factory. It was a simple, polite thing to do, but it made her feel human again. One year later, Gerda and Kurt Klein were married. Gerda Weissman's wartime story ended on a note of hope. That was rare for the millions who suffered during the Holocaust. The word Holocaust, rooted in Greek, means a sacrifice by fire. But it also means any great destruction and loss of life. From 1939 to 1945, all across Europe, Jews and people from other groups were murdered simply because of who they were. How did this happen? Chapter 1. Anti-Semitism Anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jews. It goes back thousands of years to ancient Rome. When Christianity took hold in the world, anti-Jewish feeling spread. There were false, awful stories that Jews had killed Jesus. They were blamed for causing disease and for bad crops. Sometimes this led to violent attacks against Jews. Sometimes anti-Jewish laws were passed. In certain parts of Europe, Jews couldn't own land. They could not be citizens. In more modern times, around the 1800s, countries in Europe developed fairer laws. Life opened up for Jewish people. They had more freedom. Some Jews kept their old customs. Some did not. More and more Jews considered themselves German or Austrian or French. Before, they thought of themselves as Jewish. Then, in 1941, the Kaiser, Emperor, of Germany started a world war in Europe. It raged on until 1918 with Germany's surrender. A treaty was signed with very harsh terms for Germany. The Kaiser was gone. Germany lost land. It had to disband its army. For starting the war, it had to pay billions of dollars to countries that Germany had fought against. But Germany didn't have any money. As in the past, much of the blame for Germany's woes fell on the Jews. In 1919, Germany tried to set up a democracy. A group of elected representatives was called the Reichstag. A president was elected, too. The president, in turn, chose a chancellor. The chancellor held a lot of power, but he still had to answer to the president and the Reichstag. This new government was supposed to offer a better future for Germany, but it faced big challenges. For example, how would Germany pay all the money it owed? The government thought the answer was to print money, more and more money. Soon there were so many German dollars, marks, they became almost worthless. Prices went up day by day, hour by hour. One man bought a cup of coffee for 5,000 marks. 
already a very high price. When he ordered a second cup, the price had shot up to 9,000 marks. People carried cash around in wheelbarrows. By 1929, millions of Germans were out of work. Most had their savings wiped out. Many wanted change, a new direction for the country. But who could lead the country to a new and better future? Germans turned to the worst person possible, Adolf Hitler. Chapter 2, Adolf Hitler When Adolf Hitler was a boy, no one expected much of him. He was born on April 20th, 1889, in a small town in Austria called Braunau am Inn. It bordered Germany, and the people there spoke German. Hitler's family wasn't rich, but they did fine. Hitler's father was a harsh man, strict and quick to punish. He wanted his son to work in government, but Hitler wasn't interested. He wanted to be an artist. Hitler had always been a lazy student, but after his father's death, he started failing classes. A few years later, he dropped out of school. He knew his mother would support him. She had always spoiled him. So he didn't do much of anything. He just daydreamed. In 1907, Hitler was turned down by an art school. At the end of the year, his mother died. With nothing keeping him at home, he moved to Austria's capital, Vienna. Once again, he lounged around, talking in cafes about politics, art, and ideas. Vienna had a large Jewish community, but the city was known for its anti-Semitism. Anti-Jewish newspapers and pamphlets were sold everywhere. Hitler read them all. The mayor spoke out against Jews, too. Later, Hitler would say that Vienna was where his ideas came together. Time passed. Hitler had no job. He sold his belongings and slept on park benches. Finally, he settled into a home for poor men, scraping by, selling his artwork. A failure known for fits of temper, Hitler was homeless and friendless. He left Vienna in 1913. Hitler had always felt that Germany held more promise for him than Austria. So he moved to the German city of Munich. When World War I broke out, he signed up to fight for the German army. In the army, Hitler finally found success. He won medals for bravery. When Germany surrendered, Hitler was crushed. Like so many others, he blamed Jews for the defeat, and he was ready to do something about it. Chapter 3. The Nazis In 1919, Adolf Hitler went to a meeting in Munich. It was held by a new political group, the German Workers' Party. About 25 people were there. In fact, the whole political party had only about 50 members. The party wanted a strong, proud Germany, and they blamed Jews for all the country's problems. This appealed to Hitler. He didn't believe that the Jews of Germany were real. He considered them subhuman. True Germans belong to what the party called the Aryan race. The ideal Aryan had blonde hair and blue eyes. Of course, some Jews had blonde hair and blue eyes, while Hitler himself had brown hair and brown eyes. 
But that didn't make any difference to him. Jews weren't Aryans, and he was. Hitler joined the German Workers' Party. He rose up the ranks. He gave spellbinding speeches. He knew what people wanted to hear and how to work up a crowd. Did people feel betrayed by the new government? Yes. Were they worried about jobs? Yes. Could Germany be great again? Yes. In one short year, the party grew to 3,000 members, and Hitler was its leader. Hitler chose the swastika, a hooked cross for the party's symbol. It was an image used in Indian religions. But that is not why he chose it. Some people believed that thousands of years ago, Aryan nomads had used this same symbol. So to Hitler, the swastika represented the Aryan race. Hitler also added two words to the party name, National Socialist. In German, the name was abbreviated to the NSDAP, then shortened even more. It was just known as the Nazi Party. As Nazi leader, Hitler saw two main problems. Germany needed to be bigger and stronger, and something had to be done about the Jews. In 1923, Hitler began his grab for power. On November 8th, he went to a Munich beer hall. He brought along stormtroopers, armed Nazis known for violence. German government officials were holding a meeting. He wanted to overthrow these leaders, then march to Berlin, the nation's capital. At 8.30 p.m., Hitler fired a pistol at the ceiling. With the stormtroopers' help, the officials were taken prisoner. But then, things fell apart. There were gunshots. People were killed. Hitler was arrested. His trial lasted almost a month. It was big news. In court, Hitler lashed out at the Jews. He spoke about German pride. He was sent to jail. But the trial drew even more people to the party and to Hitler. While he was in prison, Hitler entertained visitors. He feasted on wine and chocolate. He wrote a book called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. What did he struggle against? The Jewish race. He accused Jews of plotting to take over the world. Mein Kampf. During the time the Nazis were in power, millions of copies of Mein Kampf were sold. But after World War II, the German government banned it to block Hitler's hateful message. Today, a new edition is out with side notes and explanations. Will the book show readers how evil Hitler was or bring new fans to his terrible ideas? When Hitler left prison, the Nazis were more powerful than ever. They held big parades. They staged rallies. Stormtroopers and a special new military group, the SS, marched in crisp new uniforms. Many Germans wanted a hero, someone to rescue them from hard times. Their mistake was turning to Adolf Hitler to be their new leader. Hitler decided to run for president. He ran against President Paul von Hindenburg. It was a close election, but Hitler lost. Reichstag elections were held. No party had a major victory. Instead, the government was made up of many small groups. Each one worked against the others. The government came to a standstill. President von Hindenburg needed the support of the Nazis. With his own party, as well as Hitler's Nazis behind him, he'd have enough power to govern. 
so von Hindenburg appointed Hitler Chancellor. At noon, January 30th, 1933, Hitler was sworn in. By that night, thousands lined the streets to watch the SS parade through Berlin. Its officers marched in step, carrying torches and singing. At the President's Palace, Hitler stood at the window. A spotlight cast him in a bright glow. Everyone in the crowd raised their arms in the Nazi salute. One newscaster said, Nothing like this has ever been seen before. German radio broadcast the event. In Jewish homes, families listened, knowing trouble was in store. There were only about 523,000 Jews out of Germany's 67 million people. That year, about 37,000 emigrated. They left the country to start a new life. Others stayed. Some didn't have the money to leave. Others didn't want to. Germany was their home. They told themselves that Jews had gone through bad times before, and in the recent past, life had improved. Now, Jews were German citizens with full rights. They didn't believe anything terrible would happen. Soon, Hitler would fade away. Besides, he was not the real German leader. That was still von Hindenburg and the Reichstag. For now. Chapter 4. Hitler in Power One month later, the Reichstag building was set on fire. Hitler blamed his political enemies. He had thousands arrested. They were tortured and thrown into a special prison. It was outside Munich in a town called Dachau. It was the first of the Nazi concentration camps, prisons where people were concentrated in great numbers under brutal conditions. For Hitler, however, jailing political criminals was not enough. President von Hindenburg was old and frail by then and agreed to give the Chancellor, Adolf Hitler, full power. In the next few months, Hitler made all political parties illegal except his own, the Nazis. From then on, he didn't need approval from the President or the Reichstag to do what he wanted. Hitler was free to decide what to do about the Jews. His first step was to separate them from the rest of society. By doing this, he believed they'd leave Germany once and for all. Hitler began to pass anti-Jewish laws. First, he focused on schools. Students had to say, Heil Hitler, when they arrived, at the start of each class and at the end of the day. Textbooks were rewritten. Every subject needed to praise Hitler and Germany and put down Jews. If teachers didn't teach Nazi beliefs about the Aryan race, they were fired. Soon, there could only be a certain number of Jewish students in public schools. Those students had to sit in the last row. And this was just the beginning. Hitler Youth, page 32. Hitler thought young Aryans were the future of Germany. He founded the Hitler Youth in the early 1920s. Jews and other subhumans were not allowed. Boys trained to be stormtroopers and girls learned to be good wives and mothers. By 1939, membership was no longer a choice. Boys hiked, camped, and played sports. They practiced marching and shooting and starting up fights against Jews. Girls ran, swam, and learned to cook. Hitler youth held large, colorful rallies, and the group stayed loyal to Hitler to the end 
of World War II. President von Hindenburg died the next year, 1934. In short order, Hitler combined von Hindenburg's job with his own. There was no longer a president and a chancellor. There was only Hitler. On August 2, 1934, he named himself Führer, which means leader in German. More concentration camps were built. Political opponents were jailed without trials. In 1935, other groups were imprisoned, including gay people. More anti-Jewish laws were passed, too, but Hitler was careful. He didn't pass all the laws at once. He tested the mood of the country, announcing just a few laws at a time. When non-Jewish citizens didn't object, he took away more rights from Jews. In the beginning, Jews couldn't hold certain jobs. They couldn't work for the government, or practice law, or medicine, or teach in public schools. Jewish professors were kicked off the faculty of universities. Then, more laws passed. Jews couldn't marry non-Jews. They had to carry Jewish ID cards. Their stores and homes had to be marked with a Jewish star. Soon, they were no longer German citizens. New laws passed almost every month. Jews couldn't own businesses or property. They couldn't go to parks or movies or play sports with non-Jews. In time, they had to wear a badge with a yellow star on their clothes everywhere they went. For Jews, it was like a noose being pulled tighter and tighter. Chapter 5, War, page 36. Other countries watched Hitler gain power and saw what the Nazis were doing to the Jewish people but they took no action. So Hitler went further. He ignored the World War I treaty. He put an army together. In March 1938, Nazi troops marched into neighboring Austria. Hitler rode behind them. He was met by cheering crowds. Most Austrians were eager to be a part of what Hitler called the Third Reich, Germany's new empire that would soon rule the world and last a thousand years. The Austrians didn't mind harsh anti-Jewish laws going into effect. Almost immediately, Jews were attacked on the streets. That September, Hitler demanded that the Sudetenland, a Czech region, become part of the Reich too. Many Germans lived there, so it was only right, Hitler said. If he didn't get the land, he threatened war. To avoid conflict, Great Britain agreed, and other countries followed. Germany was growing stronger and bigger. And as time passed, restrictions against Jews grew stronger, too. On November 9, 1938, anti-Jewish violence swept across Germany and Austria. During Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, more than 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed, along with 267 synagogues. Shattered glass from windows lined the streets. Ninety-one Jews were killed. Afterward, the Jewish community received a bill for damages, damages done by the Nazis. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish men were arrested. They were sent to concentration camps, the first to be imprisoned just for being Jewish. 
Now, the Nazis were sure that no Jews would want to remain in the Reich. And indeed, by the end of the 1930s, more than half the Jewish population fled to other European countries, to the United States, and to Palestine. But many couldn't leave. Some simply didn't have the money. Also, other countries had set limits on how many Jewish immigrants could enter. That was because in America and in Europe, millions of people were out of work, so countries didn't want immigrants arriving and competing for the few jobs that were there. U.S. Immigration In the United States, there was also strong anti-Semitism. Although President Franklin D. Roosevelt had many Jewish advisors in his government, the mood of the country was against taking in Jewish immigrants. When the St. Louis, a ship carrying 900 German Jewish passengers, wanted to dock on the Florida coast, it was sent back to Europe. Eventually, more than 250 of its passengers were killed in the Holocaust. After Hitler seized the Czech capital city of Prague in March of 1939, European leaders finally took a stand. They said Germany had to stop its conquests. Hitler didn't listen. On September 1st, he invaded Poland. Two days later, Great Britain and France declared war against the Third Reich. It was the start of World War II. Once Germany took over Poland, anti-Jewish laws went into effect there. In addition, thousands of Poles were forced to leave their homes to make way for German settlers. Many Poles were sent to camps where they did hard labor or were killed. In the spring, Hitler invaded Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. In 1941, he took over Yugoslavia and Greece. Then in June, Nazi troops marched into the Soviet Union. Hitler was truly creating an empire. We are heroes, Hitler told the German people. We are the master race. The two sides in World War II. Two groups of countries fought each other in the Second World War, 1939 to 1945. The Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, was one group. Its goal was German rule in Europe, Italian rule around the Mediterranean Sea, and Japanese rule in the far eastern part of the world. The other group, the Allies, was led by Great Britain and the Soviet Union. The United States hoped to stay out of the war, but it joined the Allies after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, a U.S. Navy base in Hawaii, in December of 1941. The Allies' goal was to defeat the Axis powers, but it took more than four years for that to happen. Chapter 6 in the Ghetto, page 46. For Hitler, a new problem came with these victories. There were many Jews in the countries he invaded. Poland alone had 3.3 million Jewish people. What could be done with them? Hitler decided to force Jews to live in separate areas of cities and towns. Just months after the Polish invasion, the first ghettos were created. Before the war's end, there were at least a thousand ghettos in German-occupied countries. The term ghetto goes back centuries. In the past, it had meant the part of a city where Jews were forced to live. During the Third Reich, the ghettos set up by the Nazis were always in the poorest parts of a town, and never large enough for all the Jews living in them. The Warsaw Ghetto took up only 16 city blocks, yet at one point it housed almost half a million people. Even so, at first, 
many Jews thought ghettos weren't such a bad idea. They hoped it might be better to have their own little area free from Nazi attacks. That proved not to be true. The first and biggest ghettos were in Poland, in Lodz and Warsaw. Ghettos were later set up across Eastern Europe. Thousands and thousands of Jews from across the Reich were sent to the larger ones. Some ghettos were small towns with roads closed off. Others were walled-in spaces in cities. Non-Jews had to move out. Jews had to move in. Jewish councils were selected for running the day-to-day -day business of the ghettos. The mayor of one town described families moving into the ghetto, trudging silently through the snow. He wrote that there was a vast crowd of wandering people. The aged were helped by children. There were women with infants in their arms. All had bundles, ba blankets, clothes, rags. Once all the Jews were inside, the ghetto was sealed. It was closed off from the world with high walls, barbed wire, and guarded gates. Except for a few Jewish workers, those carting garbage or digging ditches, for instance, no one was allowed to leave. The penalty for escape was death. If you went too close to the fence, you just got shot, one survivor explained. The Jews were cut off in other ways, too. Printing presses, radios, and telephones were taken away. They couldn't learn what was going on in the outside world or tell anyone about their plight. In the beginning, many residents still had money and food. They tried to make ghetto life seem as normal as possible. For instance, cafes opened in the Warsaw Ghetto. Watchmakers and tailors set up shop. Children went to school, but as time wore on, life got worse. There were Nazi-run factories in the Lodz and Warsaw ghettos, where Jews were forced to make guns and uniforms for Hitler's troops. Schools were closed, so students had to meet in secret. If Nazi officials appeared, the boys and girls quickly hid their books. At any time, Nazis could come into the ghetto and seize men right off the streets. They'd make them build roads or new concentration camps. And sometimes the men wouldn't come back. They ended up in the prison camps they helped build. Food and fuel became scarce. At one point, in the Warsaw Ghetto, Nazis limited Jews to 180 calories worth of food each day. That's about the same number of calories as in one bowl of cereal. Over time, more and more Jews were brought to the Warsaw Ghetto, from Berlin, from Vienna, from every corner of the Third Reich. With little heat, food, or running water, people began to die. By spring of 1941, between five and 6,000 people were dying each month in the Warsaw Ghetto. Carts collected bodies from the streets every morning. How could people hope to survive? Some planted vegetable gardens. Some smuggled in food. Small children could squeeze through cracks in the wall. Others would wait for Nazi guards to turn away. Then they'd race through the gate to the outside world. There, they'd exchange money or goods for food. They'd hide the bread or potatoes in their clothes. When it seemed safe, 
they'd hurry back into the ghetto. Smuggling was a form of resistance. Resistance meant standing up to the Nazis, fighting back. Resistance groups sprang up in many ghettos. In the Warsaw and Lodz ghettos, young men and women traveled back and forth through underground sewer tunnels to spread the news of what was happening. It seemed no one cared what was being done to the Jews. For children, ghetto life was especially harsh. There were no parks, no trees. Every day they were hungry. Every day they lived in fear. Would a father or mother, sister or brother be taken away? People struggled to hold on to their religion and take strength from it. When one boy in Lodz named Chaim turned 13, his parents celebrated with a bar mitzvah, an important Jewish ceremony. They gave him half a loaf of bread as a present. I couldn't even imagine for how long they saved it from themselves, he said later. He cried as he ate. Chapter 7 Life in the Concentration Camps Page 56 As time went on, hundreds more concentration camps were built for prisoners of the Nazis. At every camp, as soon as prisoners arrived, men and older boys were separated from women and older girls. Generally, young children weren't held in these camps. They were too small to work. Often, they were left behind in towns or ghettos, basically orphaned. Once inside, prisoners were given a striped uniform. Men wore a jacket, pants, cap, and wooden shoes. Women were given striped skirts and tops. Every prisoner had a number. No names were ever used. At Auschwitz and some other camps, the number was tattooed onto a prisoner's arm. Next, everyone's heads were shaved. We all looked alike, said one survivor. Rich, poor, young, old. We shared the same fate. The Nazis did this for two reasons. They wanted to make prisoners feel less than human. They also used the hair to make cloth and thread for uniforms and other items. All prisoners had to work. Those sent to coal mines lasted only about a month. They died from sickness and exhaustion. In factories, if Nazi guards thought the prisoners were working too slowly, they shot them. Every camp had a Nazi commander. At the Plachau camp in Poland, Amon Goeth was said to shoot Jews for sport from his balcony. Otto Riemer at Mauthausen in Austria gave cigarettes and extra vacation time to guards who killed the most prisoners. All the camps had terrible conditions. Bunk beds were stacked side by side, one on top of the other, with two or three to a bed, sometimes more. Hundreds of prisoners used one bathroom with only a few faucets. Toilets were long slabs of wood or concrete with dozens of holes cut out for seats. Prisoners had no clean water or soap or changes of clothes. Usually, prisoners woke at 4 a.m. Breakfast was watery soup, coffee, and a piece of bread. After, everyone lined up for roll call. Thousands of prisoners stood outside in rows. It took hours. In Poland, winter temperatures were always below freezing. If prisoners had died during the night, 
their bodies were brought outside too. Everyone needed to be counted. Next, the prisoners went off in work teams. In some camps, prison orchestras played music as the workers marched outside. Many camps had a sign that read, Work will set you free. Nothing was further from the truth. At the quarry, mine, or construction site, workers had to run as they carried heavy loads. Otherwise, they would be shot. There was a lunch break, soup again. After 12 to 14 hours, they marched back to camp. Then came evening roll call, followed by soup. The next day, it started all over again. In spite of how they were treated, prisoners tried to keep some sense of their own dignity and humanity. Some wrote stories and poems. They painted and drew. Some even held religious ceremonies in secret. Still, their old lives seemed like an impossible dream. Chapter 8, The Final Solution, page 64. In June 1941, German troops crossed into the Soviet Union. About four million Jews lived in the region. Now came a new order. Don't bother sending Jews to camps or ghettos. Kill them right away. This was the next step in Hitler's plans. Special vans followed the German army from town to town. The Nazis forced Jews into them, then piped poisonous gas into the back. Outside the city of Kiev, at Babi Yar, 33,000 Jews were killed in two days. They were lined up in small groups along the edge of a ravine. Then they were shot, their bodies falling onto the dead below. Within 18 months, one million people were killed. Even so, Hitler wanted better, faster methods of murder. He decided on something called the Final Solution, a top-secret plan to completely wipe out the Jews in death camps all over Poland. The Wannsee Conference Outside of Berlin at Wannsee, a conference was held on January 20, 1942. It brought together top Nazi officials to learn about the plan for the final solution. The men discussed methods of mass murder. A poisonous gas called Zyklon B was to be used. They also talked over transportation issues. How to get all the Jews in occupied Europe to death camps. They decided Jews would be rounded up and taken by train. All the officials at Vansi gave their approval to the final solution. Poland became the land of death camps. The first was in Chelno. It went into operation in December 1941. Three others were quickly built, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka, with huge gas chambers. More than a thousand people could be killed at a time. Gas chambers were added to the concentration camp at Majdanek and built in other camps as well. The biggest camp was the one at Auschwitz. Even before the gas chambers were built, Auschwitz had been a huge complex. It had more than 40 subcamps. One subcamp alone held 10,000 inmates. It had factories, farms, and coal mines. At Auschwitz, ID numbers were tattooed on prisoners' arms. In the end, more than one million people died there. The vast majority of victims were Jewish. Hitler ordered all the ghettos emptied. 
In the Lotz ghetto, the first major roundups, mass arrests, took place in early 1942. In September, another order was issued. The SS wanted 25,000 more people, including children. Parents refused. So the Nazis declared a 24-hour curfew. No one could go outside for eight days. During that time, the SS searched apartment after apartment. If anyone resisted, they were shot. In the end, around 15,000 people were seized. At the nearby station, a train waited. It was only 30 miles from Lotz to the camp at Chelno. Anne Frank, 1929 to 1945. Anne Frank was a young Jewish girl born in Germany. When she was four, her family moved to Amsterdam to escape the Nazis. Seven years later, Hitler invaded the Netherlands. In July 1942, the Frank family went into hiding. They lived in a secret part of a building that housed Anne's father's company. For more than two years, the Franks shared the space with another family and a friend. They were unable to go outside, talk loudly, or open curtains. Anne recorded her story, her feelings, fears, hopes, and dreams, in a diary. In August of 1944, the group was discovered and arrested. Anne and her sister both died in a concentration camp, just weeks before the war ended. Anne was 15, but she lives on in her diary, which was found by a family friend. It's been translated into 67 languages and is read throughout the world. Death camps were located near railway lines, so when prisoners got off trains, they didn't have far to go. Transit camps were also set up, one outside Paris, another outside Amsterdam, one in Belgium. Jews would be arrested gathered in transit camps, then sent on to Poland and death. People lived in constant fear of these roundups. They usually began at dawn with a loud knock. Officers burst into an apartment. People were sleepy and confused and very scared. The officers searched every closet, every cabinet, to make sure they found everyone. They gave people minutes to pack before starting on a journey that would end at the death camps in Poland. Some train cars had open tops, some closed. Some were cattle cars used to move herds of cows. Each car was freezing cold in winter, boiling hot in summer. Closed cattle cars were the worst. There were no windows. People rode in total darkness. Eighty to one hundred prisoners packed into a space about the size of four elevators. They had no water or food. There was no bathroom, just a bucket. Some journeys took days. By the time the train reached the camp, Many had already died. When the train doors opened, people thought, at last, fresh air. Then they saw the camp, the prison complex with dark, gloomy buildings, guard towers and electric fences, machine guns, searchlights, SS officers with whips and rifles, vicious dogs. Page 75. At Auschwitz, SS doctors waited for the prisoners. These doctors decided each prisoner's fate in a selection. 
the strongest went to a labor camp. Those who couldn't work were sent right away to their deaths. SS officers told these people they were going to take showers to wash off the dust from the long trip. They led groups to a giant room to undress. Sometimes an officer gave out soap and towels, but this was all a trick. The door to another room opened. Prisoners saw shower heads. When they stepped inside, the door was sealed tight. No water came down. Instead, poison gas was piped in. The shower room was a death chamber. Everyone died in minutes. Afterward, the bodies were cremated, burned to ash in ovens. At first, the Allies didn't believe these death camps really existed. But the news spread. World leaders, however, didn't act. The best plan, the Allies reasoned, was to end the war as quickly as possible. And then the Jews would be helped too. But the war lasted until 1945. At that point, 12 million people half of them Jewish, had been murdered. Chapter 9, Fighting Back Page 77 Jews knew the truth about death camps, yet they continued to leave on transport trains. What else could they do? For the most part, they had no weapons, no training, and no way to fight the huge German army. But Jews didn't just go meekly off to their deaths. All along, from the very beginning of the ghettos, many Jews acted to save themselves and others. Some went into hiding. Thousands of adults escaped from ghettos into nearby forests. They formed resistance groups to stop Nazi plans. They had few supplies and little food but somehow they destroyed Nazi rail lines. They blew up power stations. Non-Jews resisted as well. One entire village in France, the chambon sur lignon hid 5,000 people, more than half of them Jews. In some instances, seeing what unspeakable things the Nazis were doing brought out the best in people. Oskar Schindler was an unlikely hero. He had joined the Nazi party in 1939 when he was 30. He took advantage of anti-Jewish laws by buying a Jewish-owned factory in Poland. There, he used Jews from the nearby ghetto as forced laborers. But Schindler wound up saving those workers, more than a thousand Jews. How did he do that? He used part of the factory to make weapons. The Jews in Schindler's factory seemed like they were doing work that helped the Nazis in the war. This may sound wrong, but these workers would not be sent off to death camps because the Nazis needed them. Plus, Schindler fooled officials. He gave them fake numbers for how many weapons his workers made. They actually made very few. At one point, Schindler's factory produced just one load of ammunition in about eight months. What else did he do? Schindler drew up a list of workers' names and skills, changing ages, and saying that doctors and lawyers were mechanics whose work was highly valued. Schindler spent all his money bribing SS officers and buying his workers' clothes, food, and medicine. He died in 1974, penniless and alone. But his people, as he called them, brought his body to Israel to be honored and buried there. One entire country stood up to Hitler. 
Although an occupied country under Hitler's control, Denmark refused to let the Nazis take its Jewish citizens. More than 7,000 Jews, along with non-Jewish family members, were smuggled in fishing boats to Sweden and safety. There were revolts in concentration camps, even at killing centers. In Treblinka, prisoners seized weapons, set buildings on fire, and ran for their lives. About a hundred survived. At Auschwitz, prisoners blew up a furnace room. The most famous story of resistance concerns the end of the Warsaw Ghetto. By fall of 1942, only 65,000 of the original half million Jews were still living there. The council chairman committed suicide in the summer rather than write lists of people to be sent off and killed. In January 1943, Nazi SS troops came through the gates to round up 8,000 people for death camps. However, a surprise was waiting for them. An army of Jews fought back. They were mostly young men and women. There weren't many, and they had few weapons and supplies. But they managed to kill many Germans, so the Nazi troops retreated. Inside the Warsaw Ghetto, more Jews joined the resistance, 700 in all. Young, old, men, women. They built hiding places. They linked sewer tunnels so many could move from place to place unseen. They made weapons. Finally, on April 19th, the Nazis came back. This time they had more soldiers, tanks, and machine guns. Even so, the Jews refused to give up. The fighting lasted for four weeks. In the end, the Nazis burned every building to the ground. The ghetto fighters had nowhere to turn. Many died. Those captured were sent to the Treblinka death camp. Only a few dozen escaped. But the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising inspired others. It stood as a symbol of great courage against evil. Chapter 10. Freedom Beginning in 1943, the tide of war turned against Germany. The Axis powers were fighting on too many fronts, and the Allies were coming at Hitler's army from every direction, north, south, east, west, and from the air. Did that stop or slow down the mass murder of Jews? No. In just one month in 1944, Germans sent 440,000 Jews from Hungary to their deaths. As the Allies approached camps in Poland, the Nazis were determined to hide their crimes from the world. They tried to destroy camps and empty out prisoners. More than 150,000 prisoners were forced to march into Germany, farther from the Allied troops. Some traveled for miles and miles in bitter cold without coats, boots, or any protection. Their only water came from falling snow. Thousands died along the way. However, the Nazis did leave some prisoners behind. Russian soldiers found 7,000 inmates at Auschwitz. Though the Germans had destroyed much of the camp, several warehouses still stood. They were filled with prisoners' belongings. Hundreds of thousands of men's suits and women's dresses that the Nazis had planned to sell. One warehouse held 14,000 pounds of human hair. Finally free, some prisoners ran to greet the soldiers. 
others felt afraid. They didn't want to come out because they didn't know what to expect. As more and more camps were liberated, Allied troops couldn't take in the horror. The sick and starving, the dead bodies stacked up like logs. Why do humans have to do this to other humans? One American medic cried out. The last camps were liberated in May 1945. Adolf Hitler was already dead. He'd committed suicide on April 30th. His government had fallen apart. His dream of a Nazi empire lasting a thousand years was shattered. On May 7th, Germany officially surrendered. The Holocaust was over. Chapter 11, After, page 92. Italy had already surrendered to the Allies in 1943, and Japan signed a peace treaty in September 1945. World War II was over. About 55 million people had lost their lives, including civilians, people who weren't soldiers, Holocaust victims, and armed forces from both sides. Top Nazis were brought to trial. They were accused of crimes against humanity. That means murder and other terrible acts directed against a whole population. The first trials were held in Nuremberg, Germany, and lasted until 1949. Nazis faced judges from the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Most were found guilty and either hanged or sent to prison. But many Nazis escaped from Germany to start new lives in other countries. For decades, Nazi hunters searched for these men and women. Over the years, some were brought to trial. One man, Adolf Eichmann, was caught in Argentina tried in Israel in 1961, and executed. Adolf Eichmann's job was to carry out the plan for the final solution. Trials continued for decades. In 2016, prison guards and office workers were still facing court charges in Germany for war crimes. These people were in their 90s. One 94-year-old witness, Leon Schwartzbaum, was a survivor of the Holocaust. He told a reporter that punishment wasn't the only reason for a trial. It was to hear the truth. But neither punishment nor the truth could change the past. Millions upon millions of people had been killed. Millions more had been uprooted forced from their homes and their countries. After the war, people tried to return to countries that had been occupied. Some found their houses destroyed. Others found they weren't wanted. Violence against Jews continued. Where would these displaced persons, DPs, go? The Allied military set up camps in Europe. In a way, the people there were still prisoners. Some lived in these camps for years. Gradually, things were sorted out. Many Jews emigrated to Israel, a new Jewish homeland created in 1948. Some left for the United States and other countries. Five years after the war, there were only 45,000 Jews left in Poland, down from more than 3 million. Germany, which had started with half a million Jewish people, now had 37,000. Austria's 250,000 Jews were reduced to 18,000. For a time, survivors of the Holocaust kept silent. 
what they had gone through was too painful to talk about. But then they began to speak out. They didn't want people to forget the horror. If people didn't hear about the Holocaust, then history might repeat itself one day. Museums and Memorials Holocaust museums and memorial sites have been built around the world. In the United States, the National United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is in Washington, D.C. But there are many other sites of remembrance from coast to coast. In Germany and Poland, concentration camps have been turned into museums. Survivors are fewer and fewer. Soon, all will have died, but their stories must be passed on to future generations. There were some German heroes in the Holocaust. They risked their lives hiding Jews, smuggling them to safety, and supporting resistance. Still, as a whole, the German people kept silent. Camp employees, secretaries who worked in Nazis' offices, ordinary German citizens, some who knew what was happening, gave the excuse that they were only following orders. But how could they watch and say nothing? Had they agreed with Hitler's ideas about a master race of Aryans? Or were they afraid to speak up in case they would be punished or killed? Yet German soldiers who refused to kill did not receive harsh punishment from military or Nazi leaders. One group of German women protested when their Jewish husbands were rounded up by police and imprisoned. The men were freed, and the couples were reunited. Gerda Weissman Klein spoke out about the Holocaust for decades. After the war, she and her husband moved to upstate New York. She raised a family, wrote books, and worked with schools to teach tolerance. She was awarded the Medal of Freedom in 2011 by President Barack Obama. That is the highest honor a U.S. civilian can receive. Hatred and tyranny are not over, she declared. What if more people had stood up to Hitler and the Nazis? A Protestant minister in Germany admitted to once having been anti-Semitic. His name was Martin Niemöller. He had been a member of the Nazi party. During the war, however, Niemöller changed. He saw the evil for what it was. He spent seven years in concentration camps for speaking out against Hitler. In his speeches, Niemöller named groups of people who were taken away while he had remained silent. He included Jews, communists, Catholics, and more. But he always ended with, Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Genocide The word genocide was coined during the Holocaust. Its definition is, The deliberate killing of people from a particular group. Tragically, the mass killing of Jews by Nazis is not the only instance of genocide. There have been others in much more recent times. Starting in 2003 in Sudan, a country in northeastern Africa, wild gangs sponsored by the government began slaughtering people who lived in an area called Darfur. Victims were killed because of their race, not their religion, with black Darfuri targeted. To date, more than 400,000 people have been killed and 3 million sent into exile. The End.